time here. We're a little behind, but uh, our next presenter for the second half is Dr. K.G. Swan. Uh, Dr. Swan is a assistant That'll clinical professor um, through the medical school. He's a sports medicine fellowship <clears throat> trained physician, and uh, he's going to talk to us about bony stress injuries of the pelvis and the hip. Eric, you wanted me here? Okay. All right. Thanks, Eric. Thank you to Eric and thank you. There's a lot of stuff going on behind the scenes over there with the AV and the, uh, uh, the computer setup. So uh, I wanted to thank those guys for all that they're doing because they're pretty busy back there. Good to go. So I have no disclosures to report. <clears throat> Let's talk about some semantics first. So a stress fracture is a fatigue fracture often caused by submaximal stress. This may be different than what we call a stress reaction, which is bone inflammation seen on a bone scan or an MRI, showing a reaction or edema, but not quite a fracture line. Another term we use is stress injury, which includes stress fractures, but also stress reactions, overuse injuries, even growth in thesiopathies, which we see, Seaver's disease, Osgood-Schlatter, tendonitis. And then a, a more in vogue term these days, one we're sort of getting used to using a little bit more is bony stress injury, a newer term to include sort of the whole spectrum of stress fractures. <clears throat> a little more terminology. So fatigue fractures is what we typically are talking about when we're talking about stress fractures. We consider this an abnormal stress on what we think is a normal bone. We'll touch on that in a minute. And this is the rule of twos that perhaps many of you use with your student athletes. Too much, too soon, too far, <clears throat> often too intense, and then certainly with the teenagers and the growing skeleton, too little rest, too little sleep, too little recovery. <clears throat> Some use the stress triad to describe this, so something new or different, perhaps a new sport, a new season, even new sneakers or running surface, <clears throat> something strenuous, and then something repetitive. It's not a one-time thing that's causing these stress fractures. Um, they don't only occur in young athletes. <clears throat> Um, not to be confused with insufficiency fractures, which is considered a normal stress on an abnormal bone. So typically we're talking about the osteoporotic patients. So normal everyday activities can cause a fracture in a mechanically weak bone. Low bone quality, mass, or impaired bone repair. So normal walking, normal sitting can cause a fracture in these patients. There's a whole list of things here. I won't get into them t in too much detail, but uh, osteoporosis being the most common, but other endocrine abnormalities, uh, deficiencies, diet abnormalities, and then medications as well, not to miss those. I highlighted bisphosphonates, which many of you may have heard, uh, Fosamax being sort of the flagship one that uh, got in a little bit of uh, uh, controversy for trouble with bone repair. So this was normal bones that ended up having trouble with bone repair or remodeling, leading to insufficiency fractures. <clears throat> Uh, parents and families often have some uh, trouble understanding what a stress fracture is. Uh, people often think of the bones as a, as a, a, a tube or just a, 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 a static piece of the uh, anatomy and not a dynamic organ. So this is an analogy I sometimes use. Consider the skeleton, uh, more, or the bones, more uh, somewhat like the sand on the beach. Our skeleton, our bones turn over every day sort of like the normal daily churn of the ocean and the sand on the beach. It's there every day, but it's different every day, okay? You get a big, huge hurricane, Hurricane Sandy, people down the shore understand this, you get a fracture, okay? That's a broken femur. A sudden, a sudden storm or a high tide might be a bone bruise, that's gonna recover, but several storms over the winter have changed that beach. It's different now. This might be how you describe a, uh, a stress fracture. They seem to start to listen when you describe the bones as something that is not so static and actually is dynamic and therefore can, can suffer from overuse. <clears throat> so the incidence is about 1% in the general population, much more common in runners. 90% of stress fractures occur in the lower extremities, typically the tibia or the metatarsals. More common in women, more common in the preseason, new season, new sport, something new. And uh, they can be season ending. This is nicely described by a uh, 
uh, Rizzoni's uh, summary uh, last year in the Journal of Athletic Training. <coughs> risk factors for stress fractures, you can divide these up into intrinsic and e extrinsic risk factors, ex ones that we potentially can, uh, can modify. So our training regimen, distance, intensity, season, running surface, sneakers, <coughs> nutrition, uh, supplements, what's our diet like, oral contraceptives may play a role, other medications as well, corticosteroids being one of them. And sick, gender definitely plays a role, <coughs> prior history of stress fracture, menstrual ca characteristics do matter, we're going to get into that, and then bone mineral density and other diseases. These are all potential risk factors for stress fractures, but which ones really make a difference? The literature is not great out there for many things in orthopedics, but certainly as far as stress fractures and pelvic type stress fractures, uh, the literature is poor. But a nice uh, meta-analysis systematic review looking at definite risk factors uh, for uh, stress fractures. And uh, the only two that they were able to fully document were a prior history of a stress fracture and female gender. We know these are risk factors. <coughs> Speaking of female gender, the, fem the uh, female athlete triad, I think most of us probably are aware of that, this in this room. Actually, give me a hands up. You heard of this female athlete triad? Good. Okay, good. So, perhaps a decade ago, that, that wasn't the case. So we're all aware of that now, but it has changed, I would say, in the past five or ten years. Back when I was training, the triad was osteoporosis, amenorrhea, and an eating disorder. Then the eating disorder evolved a little bit into disordered eating, meaning not necessarily a, uh, anorexia or bulimia, but perhaps uh, uh, an improper diet or uh, calorie restrictions, things of that nature. It has all evolved into poor bone health, so it doesn't have to be osteoporosis. It may just be osteopenia or osteomalacia from vitamin D deficiency. Menstrual dysfunction may not mean amenorrhea, but just abnormal menses. Maybe they're spaced out further. Maybe they're a little more sporadic. <clears throat> Decreased energy availability. So we don't necessarily have an eating disorder or even disordered eating. We may just not be getting enough calories. So it has evolved a little bit, and we continue to learn more about this. Kate Ackerman is one of the leaders in this field of female stress-related uh, fractures and injuries. Uh, she has a variety of studies, including this retrospective review with a large number of uh, athletes, uh, mostly runners, and she was looking at, uh, she compared runners, uh, at, sorry, athletes, non-athletes, and then their, how it tied into uh, their menstrual cycle. They measured DEXA scans, high-resolution CAT scans, uh, fracture history, menstrual history, diet history, <coughs> and family history. Uh, and some interesting findings. Uh, Weight-bearing athletic activity increased bone density in athletes who had a normal menstrual cycle. That makes sense. We, we support weight-bearing activity for a healthy skeleton. <clears throat> but in those with menstrual dysfunction, the bones, bone density did not increase as you might expect it would with their athletic activity. It actually was about the same as the non-athletes. <clears throat> in addition, weight-bearing ac athletic activity increased the fracture risk in those with menstrual dysfunction by a large margin. Almost half of them had a history of a fracture compared to the normal athletes who a quarter of them had some sort of fracture and the non-athletes who uh, only 12 and a half percent of them had a fracture. Now those, the non-athletes, those are more typical of just fractures, breaks, whereas the, uh, the athletes with the menstrual dysfunction primarily had stress fractures. <clears throat> Age of menarche matters. So if it's delayed and how delayed it is matters for your history of stress fracture. <clears throat> uh, in addition, uh, eating disorders, or disordered eating, as it was described. A quarter of the patients with abnormal menstrual function had some sort of disordered eating compared to the normal uh, menstrual cycle athletes and the non-athletes, which it was somewhat non-existent. Um, contrary to what you might think, the, the vitamin D levels were higher in the, in the athletes with uh, abnormal menstrual cycle, so they're still figuring out like, how that plays a role. So fatigue fractures, stress fractures, abnormal stress on a normal bone. I have the question mark there because we're starting to learn that maybe the bone isn't normal. Okay, so in Ackerman's study, the oligoamenorrheic young women, so abnormal menstrual cycles, um, didn't 
benefit from the uh, benefit, didn't have the benefits of weight-bearing activity on their skeleton. Why is that? <clears throat> in her high-resolution CAT scan component of the <clears throat> sorry, the uh, microarchitectural strength differences uh, were more, more pronounced uh, in those who had multiple stress fractures. So they were seeing some differences in the architecture of the bone and it was more pronounced on those who were experiencing these stress fractures. The bones are different. We're not fully sure what's happening there, but the bone may not be normal. <clears throat> in addition, a study this year um, in male athletes, uh, they did a, sort of a similar study looking at the com composition of bone, both uh, trabecular bone and, and cortical bone. And the take home here is that the, the bone architecture is, does not appear to be quite normal in those who are getting stress fractures before they get the stress fracture. So what can we do about that? Uh, vitamin D and calcium supplementation, does it help? This is actually a very good study um, of female Navy recruits from about 10 years ago. It's a randomized controlled trial. Uh, half the recruits were given calcium and vitamin D supplements and half were given a placebo. They had eight weeks of their standard training and they noted that there were 20% fewer stress fractures in the group that was given a simple supplement of calcium and vitamin D. Additional findings, um, uh, amenorrhea, tobacco history, poor pre-fitness training, and, uh, and then also uh, progesterone-only uh, oral contraceptives were found to be other risk factors. So smoking, we don't see that hopefully too much in our high school athletes, but smoking matters in these Navy recruits, but then pre-fitness uh, status matters. So being in shape before you dive into that preseason regimen is probably a good idea. Let's get into some specific stress fractures. So femoral neck stress fractures are a serious injury that must not be missed. This is considered a high risk stress fracture. It may not heal and it has definite ramifications if it doesn't. These athletes typically present with groin pain, uh, but important to note, they can present with vague anterior thigh pain okay, anterior thigh pain or even isolated knee pain. They don't even complain of hip pain. Um, if this completes to a displaced femoral neck fracture, this will have serious ramifications. Why is that? The arterial blood supply to the femoral head, as many of you may know, is, is tenuous. You have a fracture through, whoops, fracture through the femoral neck that displaces, the blood supply uh, gets cut off, and then you can end up with uh, avascular necrosis, this is a normal hip, abnormal hip, this is avascular necrosis, the hip dies, uh, and then they need a hip replacement. That's not a good option in a young athlete. We prefer to fix simple screws before it displaces. That's a simple operation with a typically a good outcome. Sometimes you hear people talk about the side of the fracture. Does the side matter? The tension side or the compression side? So biomechanically, if we look at the mechanical axis comes through the hip, the top part, the superior part is the tension side and the bottom uh, half, the inferior half of the femoral neck is the compression side when you walk on it. So this would be a Tension-sided fracture, compression-sided fracture, this would be a transcervical complete fracture. You can see where the weight comes through, and it does matter where this is in terms of how we treat these and the risk for displacement. On the top left, you see a uh, tension-sided incomplete fracture. The central slide has a compression-sided fracture on this MRI. This would be a complete fracture through the femoral neck. So how do we diagnose these? The history matters, just like any uh, medical condition, but certainly with stress fractures, what have they been doing? Uh, if you pay attention to their, their story, uh, oftentimes you'll know right away. Well, I just started training for a marathon and, and uh, increased my running to you know, 20 miles uh, at, a, at a clip, and now my, I have hip pain. So uh, the physical, um, there's not a lot to do with this physical if you're really honing in on that stress fracture. Groin pain with passive range of motion, you do want to examine both sides because it, is, uh, it can happen um, uh, bilaterally. X-rays can be normal. The MRI is uh, the imaging modality of choice. The treatment, if there's a transcervical fracture line, meaning a complete fracture line through the femoral neck, that patient's uh, made non-weight bearing if they're not already. 
how they're put in a wheelchair, they need to go to the operating room today or tomorrow to protect that hip. If it's a tension-sided fracture line, that's at risk. So you could consider non-weight bearing and crutches and non-operative treatment, but most of us would treat that with surgery as well, uh, screw fixation of that fracture so it doesn't complete. A uh, little bit more uh, controversial, I suppose, is the compression-sided fracture, where that one actually is good evidence to show that you can treat that non-operatively, um, protected weight-bearing, close monitoring, but there is fear there that that could complete itself, and then you get a problem. If there's only a stress reaction, no fracture line on the MRI, those we can treat with activity modification, no surgery. This has been studied uh, in the uh, radiology literature. Uh, these authors uh, divided stress fractures uh, into low grade and high grade based on edema or a fracture line and then the extent of it. This would be considered a grade one by their criteria. Uh, this is a compression sided area of edema. There's no fracture line. Grade two has a little bit more edema, really sort of the whole thing is starting to look a little white, um, but uh, uh, no fracture line. Compared to grade three, which has a fracture line going across uh, less than half of the uh, femoral neck, a grade four would go all the, um, more than 50% across. So they studied this uh, retrospectively. Grade ones and twos were easily treated non-operatively. Grade threes could be treated uh, non-operatively, safely, uh, and uh, did not, none of them uh, went on to displace. Grade fours, go, the stress fracture line goes across more than 50% of the femoral neck, those were treated surgically. <clears throat> Grade threes and fours did uh, need a longer time to return to duty. So how about the rest of the pelvis, other stress fractures? We do see these, we see stress fractures uh, in the sacrum, the rami, the symphysis pubis, the iliac wing. This patient with clearly a bony metabolic problem has had fractures throughout her pelvis. Her iliac wings, by her sacrum, her rami, pubic symphysis. So this is typically due to a bony insufficiency rather than a uh, fatigue fracture or overuse. Um, but an, uh, a workup for the etiology that is appropriate. These have been reviewed in a couple different uh, recent studies. Um, what are the risk factors? So for insufficiency fractures of the sacrum, Risk factors include age greater than 71, osteoporosis. Interesting, very commonly you'll see this in the literature, a history of pelvic radiation treatment. So gynecological malignancies, radiation treatment, these patients are at high risk for stress fractures throughout their pelvis, their sacrum. Rheumatoid arthritis, corticosteroid use once again. Fatigue fractures, stress fractures, um, are seen in people around the age of 25, so a little higher than some of the other literature showing tibial stress fractures, metatarsal stress fractures. Recent increase in training, typical. Deficient diet, typical. This part I found very interesting. 43% of these uh, athletes with fatigue fractures, stress fractures, were found to have low bone mineral density at that age. So they have abnormal bone. <clears throat> How do they present? back pain, sometimes groin pain. <clears throat> Tenderness about the sacrum can be found, uh, can determine, uh, can reveal some sacral pain. Neurologically, typically intact. X-rays are typically negative. MRI, you're looking for edema in the sacrum or a fracture line. This is a SPECT scan, higher level uh, type CAT scan, nuclear scan, showing a signal in the uh, left-sided sacrum there. Treatment is straightforward. Weight bearing is tolerated, medications as needed. They do need therapy. Um, if they have a stress fracture, fatigue fracture, you need to decrease the offending activity and slowly build back up. If it's an insufficiency fracture, then we do want to try and uh, understand and then treat the underlying disease. Osteoporosis, uh, vitamin deficiency, malabsorption syndrome, medications, maybe those need to be altered. So we included avulsion injuries in this part of the talk as well. Traumatic, be considered uh, overuse type injuries. So the apophysis, just to go through the lingo, this is a secondary center of ossification that contributes to the size and shape of a bone, but not the length. Usually fuses 
uh, later than the physis of the long bones. Importantly, it's a site of attachment of the origin or insertion of muscles. Um, common site. It, it's sometimes considered the weak link in the skeleton at this point in their growth. Um, acute injuries may result in displacement of the apophysis. Um, it's been described as a rapid, forceful, eccentric lateral flexion or rotation moment uh, about the uh, torso uh, due to the abdominal musculature. Much, much more common in young males than females for unclear reasons. Um, chronic injuries uh, act like a stress fracture or apophysitis. So here's a few locations around the pelvis. We have our iliac crest where our, our gluteal, gluteal muscles come from, our internal obliques come from, our transverse abdominis. Dr. Boyarski is going to talk about that stuff in just a minute. Our ASIS, common place to get an avulsion fracture. This is where your sartorius originates from. AIIS, anterior inferior iliac spine, where the direct head of your rectus quad, mu quad uh, musculature comes from. Um, they typically, when these happen acutely, they present with sudden severe pain. Non-contact injuries typically, um, you may, they may hear or feel a pop. Ambulation can be very difficult. I've had athletes taken away on a stretcher and in an ambulance because they are very painful and they can't walk at times. But not all present acutely. They can present like a stress fracture. Um, the exam's usually straightforward. They have focal tenderness, but also difficulty with active range of motion, flexing the hip, doing a straight leg raise or doing an abdominal crunch, those will all bother the site of that muscle attachment. Uh, I think this part's important. The workup includes x-rays, but these patients sometimes go to the ER and the films may be read as normal. Um, the ER doesn't typically get the oblique views that we often want to see these properly. They can be subtle even though the presentation is not subtle. So here's a fracture right here. This is our ASIS avulsion. That hurts a lot even though it doesn't look like a heck of a lot on the x-ray. A little harder to see is your uh, AIIS avulsion, so that you need an oblique view for that. The uh, crest avulsions, very hard to see, especially on this projection here and here. So sometimes you have to get a CAT scan. On this view, you'll see the entire iliac crest has been pulled off. That's going to be quite painful, even though that x-ray was not that impressive. <clears throat> The stress fracture component, the apophysitis, you might see widening of the physis right here compared to the contralateral side. That's been going on for a little while. They'll be sore right there. The MRI shows edema in the iliac wing. The treatment for these, usually non-operative, even when they're displaced like that, we still typically treat these non-operatively because they do heal. But it's rest, PT, slow return to play, four to six weeks later. Um, operations rarely considered, maybe in a chronic case that just hasn't improved. There's not good evidence-based literature to really tell us uh, the best uh, treatment for these. So our take-home points, uh, insufficiency fractures are com commonly occur around the pelvis in abnormal bone. These are the uh, elderly osteoporotic type fractures. Bony stress injuries are a spectrum of conditions in athletes from stress reactions to stress fractures. They may be, this may be in normal or we're starting to learn abnormal bone in a different way. Femoral neck stress fractures can be an orthopedic emergency. Take those seriously. MRI imaging is the modality of choice, is my references. Thank you very much.